Ryan A., thank you for joining us today. Pleasure to have you here. And if anybody is the perfect host uh, and you know somebody who really has personal experience of something like this, it is you yourself. You were in prison for 10 years for a crime that you didn't commit and then were exonerated. But first, just tell me, you know, why, why, are you, why are you doing this now? Why are you doing a TV show? Why are you helping others instead of, you know, taking care of yourself? You lost 10 right. years of your life. Right. Well, it's an honor to be here. Thank you so much. Uh, great question. Um, you know, it, doing this show is kind of taking care of myself. I think, you know, looking back, I lost 10 years of my life, 19 to 29. I missed all of my 20s. And right now, it doesn't, it, it doesn't make sense. I shouldn't have lost that for anything, right? I have nothing to do with this crime. But if I can stop this from happening to other people, if I can expose injustice and maybe get accountability for police and prosecutors, then those 10 years I lost will mean something because other people won't lose you know, years of their life. So. How many people did you meet while you were in prison who, who also said that, the, that they were innocent or that said that the same thing happened to them? Uh, I, met, I met probably you know, 20 that said they were innocent and, and 10 of them I would say that I, I definitely believe are most likely innocent. And, um, and, that's just in the prison that I was in, mm -hmm. but otherwise, you know, I, I've met so many people. I get emails every day, and they are heartbreaking. You know, families just reaching out for help because they, they don't have the funds, and you know, I mean, you can't. It's stacked against you. The state has limitless power, limitless resources, and and we, the public, we don't have anything. And so you get these emails, and it's just every day. It's more more cases that you want to look into, and hopefully expose to the world. Now, obviously, every case is unique, but. Is there anything that you feel, is there some type of pattern that does emerge when you oh. see some kind of you know, wrongdoing on yeah. the part of the state and putting the wrong person in jail? Certainly, there, there are a lot of patterns. That's a great point. And, and the reality is you look at these cases and you see that there wasn't a thorough investigation. The police picked some people up and they put their blinders on. And once the blinders go on, that's it. I mean, that's, your life is pretty much over at that point. They don't look at who else could have committed the crime. They start hiding evidence that proves that person's innocence. And so you see these factors over and over and over again. So it all starts with the interrogation. And people need to realize, if you get picked up and you're in an interrogation, they're trying to get a conviction against you at that point. It's not about finding the truth. So you should really avoid speaking to the police. That's why they tell you, get an attorney, don't talk to the police. It's, it's the best advice you can get. But why is that the case, right? I mean, in, in, That's in, a great question. In, yeah, in part of the series, right. you, know, you, you go back and you talk to some people who were witnesses who had give, given some type of, um, of a statement, at least to the police, and then they just figured, well, like, well, they're the police, they're handling it, right? right? Like, yeah. people still have faith in the system, mm -hmm. uh, or at least used to still have faith in the system. I had faith in the system. Still? No, I had, I had. I had 100% faith in our system. I, you know, when they picked me up, I was like, okay, well, they're just gonna look at the facts, and I'm gonna go home, it's that simple. And that's the way it should be. Not what happened in my case, it's not what happened in so many other cases, and I'm wondering, if there's a bad apple here or there, and then they, they hide evidence, or they don't look at the facts, and you know they end up sending an innocent person to prison, that's one thing. But when this happens in every state across our nation, over and over and over again, you have to wonder, what is going on here? And those are the questions that have to be answered. The reality is that until there's accountability, until these people are held accountable, and put in prison for hiding evidence, manipulating evidence, you know, basically making up evidence, then nothing's gonna change, or we're gonna keep losing innocent lives. I don't understand how another person can do this to another person, but it happens every day. And if they're gonna to continue to do that because of the, the procedures that are in place, those procedures have to change. Well, one of the things that's so interesting to me, and um, you still speak about Charles Erickson, who is, is essentially the, the reason that mm -hmm. you were in prison. Maybe not, you can correct me on that, but you know, he, he, uh, at first said that, that you guys were together, but that you guys didn't really remember what had happened that night. Uh, and then slowly it all pieced together and then he had a very detailed description right. of what happened and, uh, and implicated you. He's still in prison now. He later recanted his testimony, but you want to help him still. Right. Uh it's, it's very complex, right? And I think when yeah, people look at Yeah, sorry, I've oversimplified it there in my, <laughs> no. in my brief explanation. But. It's quite all right. Well, I've lived it, so I've, I've had to understand it. And, and otherwise, I probably wouldn't, um, you know. So the reality is you have a kid who was picked up by the police. He's in this interrogation. He ends up being told that people see him at this crime scene. He thinks he was blacked out. I think he was asleep. But the reality is they're saying, you were there. The, these people saw you there, you had to have something to do with this. So he says, well, if I was, then Ryan you know, must have been with me. They, a quarter of all wrongful convictions that have been proved innocent by DNA evidence, 
people have confessed to those crimes and they had nothing to do with it. So it's not one or two people making these weird decisions. This is a systemic issue and we have to address that. And, and Erickson is one of those individuals. So I look at it and I say, Erickson is one of these 25%. This is a problem that's happening in our interrogations. We need to change that. So who's responsible? The detectives are responsible for that. The people who are our authorities, the people who are there to serve and protect us, they are responsible because they, are, they should be looking at the facts and determining what's real and what's not. And in this case, they did not do that. And that's what you see in most of these. It's one of those where you can see it time and time and time again. And until they start to be you know, held accountable for not caring about justice and truth, then you're going to see it happen over and over again. So Erickson is a pawn. He is a victim. He's one of many victims that have been you know, taken advantage of the same way. And unfortunately, my life was thrown in there as well. Did you always feel that way about him, or is that something that you've I didn't, come no. to terms with now? Right, and that's, that, that's what you know, I didn't understand it at first. I didn't know. When I was arrested, you didn't hear about wrongful convictions that often. This is you know, 13 years ago. It's picked up a lot since then, which is great. And we're talking about this. But I didn't know what was going on. I thought this kid was just making things up for no reason. I didn't understand that the police were, were lying to people and they were legally allowed to do this. They were manipulating people. That they were fabricating evidence. So now that I can see how the system operates and that it's not just these people, it happens all the time, it starts to make sense. And you realize at that point that Erickson is a Jerry Trump is a victim, and there are a lot of people who were victimized in this case, including the victim's family, because they were lied to by police and prosecutors. Yeah, well, I mean, ultimately, uh, you know, we've done some work, too, with wrongful convictions. I feel like that's that's one of the uh, one of the things that you always hear and kind of people don't think about until after the fact, which is that for those who are the family members, the loved ones of the victims, they want some kind of justice. And so if you don't have the right person who is responsible for that crime, uh, then you're not really getting that for them either, Absolutely. right? And some type of, of closure and some type of justice and, and peace of mind for that family. So let's talk about the way that you structure the series here, because you're not just looking at one case. You're looking at uh, how many, actually, total? Because I've only seen the first two episodes, so yeah. I know I know that you do <laughs> two cases, but how many are you going to do throughout this whole series so uh, We pick up a third case um, in, in one of the episodes, you know, further on down the line. So it'll ultimately be three cases. And we get to delve deep into all of those cases and actually do a thorough investigation, which wasn't done initially. And, uh, and we uncover some very interesting things that I, even myself, I wasn't expecting to see. And what I've noticed going back and looking at these cases and the other cases I looked at, you think you've seen it all. And you think you've seen all the corruption and all the messed up stuff that happens in our legal system. But the reality is you start digging in these cases and you're just shocked every time. Like, how can this happen? How can it be worse? than this last case that I just saw. And then you read the next case and you're like, how can this be worse? It's just, so it's, it's frightening, but it's amazing that we have the opportunity to expose it. And I think people watching it will be appalled at what they see. I want to read a few, read a few comments here. Uh, Alexandria says, it's awful, bless you. Rachel says, I'm loving the show. It's so sad that these innocent people are being locked up. And Elizabeth says, I watched this earlier and it was quite captivated by this show. And Jody says, Ryan, so glad that you're helping others. Who picks the ones that you help? We all choose. Um, it, you know, this year we it was we only had so much time, and you know we're getting hundreds, if not thousands, of people sending cases in, and I get a lot um, personally. So it's about finding the right cases that you know that we can see haven't been investigated, that have certain you know telltale signs that we know that you know, they might be innocent. We don't know when we pick up the case if they're innocent or not, so it's really, really important. And then we have an attorney who's, you know, can get us the discovery. Discovery is very, very important. It's all the information in the case. It's not easy to get, so we need access to that. And so that really limits what cases we can work with. And um, and for this, this first, you know, season, we want to deal with the families. To me, that's the most important thing. Mm -hmm. My family's had to go through a lot. The victims' families, in, in all these cases, have to go through a lot. So. I want to show what these families are experiencing and, and lend a voice to them and their experiences. So there are a lot of factors, much more than that as well. And um, and we came up with these cases. Uh, we, I wish we could have done so many more, and eventually we will. Um, regardless if, if I'm doing this this series or not, I'm going to be working on cases for the rest of my life. So just do what, what we can. What uh What did you learn that that maybe surprised you? You know, in this whole process too of just what it's like going around and trying to find people, especially if this is something that happened decades ago, uh, right? Find old witnesses or piece together the legal reasoning, the legal, the legal documents. What's really the di most difficult part about it? 
Oh, wow. There's a lot of difficult parts. I think I, for me, I found myself in the homes of detectives who had done a poor job. And, and when you look at some of these cases, I mean, I do believe, and I, you know, as we get through the season, that, you know, some of these guys are, are innocent. So I'm dealing with these detectives who have withheld evidence from them or put the blinders on. And so talking to them and, and seeing what they went through, what they're telling us they went through in their process of getting these convictions, it's hard to hear some of the stuff they say because it is so wrong and it's so fundamentally out of place with what we expect our, our authorities to be doing. Mm -hmm. And yet they'll talk about it freely and think that they're doing the right thing. And it's, it's, so they're still defensive. They're still defensive. And even if they're not defensive, they're just, they're, they don't realize what they're saying is wrong. And it affects human beings' lives. So it's training is, is a big issue and, and showing them better practices. So hopefully we get to expose that and then you know start a dialogue with our police and our prosecutors and work together to make the system better. Because I believe a lot of these people would want to do the right thing. They're just not trained properly or they don't know that they're making these mistakes. Really? Some. I would say... <laughs> You're giving I'm gonna, them I'm gonna the, give the benefit, benefit of the doubt. doubt. I am. Um, you know, I, I, I have one of my really good friends is a, is a police officer, and I know there's a lot of good police officers, there's a lot of good prosecutors, but it's the system which they work in and what they're allowed to do. You give a person absolute power and absolute immunity, it's going to corrupt absolutely. And that's the, that's the system our police and prosecutors are dealing in right now. And it corrupts human beings. And, you know, we're losing a lot of innocent lives because of that, and I think a lot of Families of victims are being re-victimized because of that, and it's it's horrific, and it can happen to any of us at any time, as you can see with me and, and so many of the other exonerees. One of the things you are doing, though, is looking at potential other suspects. Oh, certainly. Right, and uh, and sometimes there are people who were questioned briefly by the police, but then they kind of dropped uh, dropped looking into that line because they found their one person that they really wanted to zero in on. What is that like for you, uh, right? I mean, knowing that you could potentially be then labeling someone who's innocent as a potential guilty party, right? Yeah. Having been on the other side of that, absolutely. I assume that you approach that with, with a certain amount of weight. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, you have to approach it with caution, and we definitely don't want to accuse anyone of anything. It's gathering the facts and letting, letting those facts speak for themselves and letting these individuals speak for themselves. And I certainly won't accuse anyone. You know, I think that if we gather evidence and it points towards a person, then you know we will do more work to, to determine whether or not that person is innocent or guilty. But the fact remains, you just put the information out there and let the public see it and determine for themselves like they should with any case. The problem is with most cases, the information never gets dispersed, right? The police and the prosecutors get out the information that they want the public to see and then they hide the rest. And that's uh, it's very difficult. And, and we believe our jury system is functional. And when you go to trial, all the information doesn't come out 100% of the time. Not all the information comes out. And that's the way our, our trial system works. And that's, uh, it's, it's frightening if you think about it. So yeah, it's, it's a good point. Um, certainly when you're watching the show, be aware of not jumping to conclusions and blaming other people and certainly not talking about it if you have a belief, you know, getting on there on the online and, and saying that because that can hurt a person's life. I want to read another comment here. Uh, Lisa says, bless you for making this subject more known with such a kind heart after what you went through. I hope this will help open up cases and free the innocent from incarceration and or death row. I'll definitely watch this program. And Cassie Holbert says, what can we do to help? Well, well thank you, Lisa. And, and Cassie, I think right now what we can do to help is spread awareness about what is going on in our legal system. For me, I didn't understand it. I didn't know it when I was 19. My family hadn't experienced it. So it's talking to our friends and our neighbors about what's going on with our legal system. This is our legal system. We can get caught up in it and treated the same way. So once we, we have a dialogue about what's going on with our legal system and everybody understands that, then we can start to enact different laws or, or you know make changes so that police and prosecutors are held accountable and that accountability is for us and our safety as members of the public in our society. So I think it, it all starts with, with the knowledge of what's going on in our legal system and the fact that you can see it and you know it. Um, spread that awareness to everyone else and have them spread that awareness and ultimately we're gonna get to a better place. But until we see what's going on, we pull back that curtain, which so many of us, you know, we're, we're not aware of. Until we pull back that curtain, nothing's gonna change. Uh, one of the other things that's nice about the program too, and you know, it's at least nice for, for a viewer, I don't know how it is for you going through it, but we kind of see your own 
process that you're working through because sometimes these cases are going to a rally that's held by the family members that stirs up certain emotions right. for you. Uh, you know, what, what have been some, some difficult moments in making this show? Um, definitely, you know, sitting down with the families, it's, uh, my family has gone through so much. And for me, being in prison, I knew what my day would be like. And, you know, I know maybe, you know, it's my hundredth day in, and I know that today it's gonna be okay because nobody's gonna try to stab me or whatever. But my family, they never get that relief. They never know if I'm safe or if I'm in danger, and they're always in fear, and that's what these, these families are dealing with. So I, I talk to the families of people who are in prison right now who may be innocent. I talk to the families of people who, you know, th their, their family member was victimized. And it's just so heavy, it's so difficult, but they need to have a voice. We need to talk about them and respect them. And I think the authorities haven't given them that respect to, to actually treat them in a way that's going to you know, show them the actual facts of the case and let, let them believe whatever they will with the facts because authorities will tell them what to believe and we're showing them the evidence and we're saying, you know, see what's really going on here. Yeah. And, I think, uh, and I think that's really wrong that they haven't had that opportunity and to sit down with them, it means so much to me. And it's difficult, you know I mean? It, uh, those are difficult days for me. It's hard to get through, but I know it means so much and it means, it means the world to me. But uh, emotionally, definitely very draining and I'm, I'm I'm hoping that everyone watching will be able to see that and see how much this impacts people, how much it impacts their lives and why we need changes. Well, and you say in the show too, at a certain point when you get uh, emotional that, you know, that's kind of a part of yourself that you had blocked off. Mm -hmm. Was that just a, a coping mechanism? Certainly. I mean, in prison, emotion isn't something that you want to, you want to show, right? Uh, if you're, if you're emotionally vulnerable in prison, then you're gonna be taken advantage of. People can play you and they can, they can you know, play games, essentially. So in prison, you just, you know, you turn it off, you know? It's uh, like the Book of Mormon, you know, turn it off, like a light switch, you know? It's just, it's, it's not something that exists in there. And that's, you do it for 10 years of your life. I did it for all of my 20s and um, so, I mean, how are you turning it back on now, right? right? How, are you, how are you so well-adjusted, I guess, is, is the question I'm asking. Yeah, well, well-adjusted is an interesting thing. I get that a lot, but it's just like people see me um, through Instagram or Twitter or on the show, but, I mean, I, I, every day is a struggle, you know? I'm trying to fight for my own place in the world. I don't know where I belong in the world coming out. I know a lot of the other exonerees don't, and um, I certainly struggle. I talk to other exonerees and try to find a good place, but... What I realized over this past year is that, you know, the reality is this, this happened. I lost 10 years of my life. I was taken advantage of by our legal system. My family was, and it's going to leave scars, right? You can't get through it without scars. And I want to be, I want to be through it without scars. I've worked really hard on myself mentally and physically, but the reality is that these scars exist. And until you acknowledge that and you can start to deal with that, then um, it's going to be very difficult. So it took me two years to, to realize that. And so now I have, and um, I'm learning a better way, but in that, it's uh, hopefully I can give back to others and help them find their peace more, which is helping me in turn find my peace. So. Some uh, therapeutic problem. It is, it is. And I wish everyone had the opportunity to speak to other uh, victims' families and, and help them through because um, I think that gives you so much. You know? So it's, it's not purely altruistic that I'll go in there and help these people. I'm getting a lot out of myself and it's absolutely necessary for my growth and, and my success in life just to, to my mental success, you know. So. All right. Well, Ryan, thank you so much for joining thank us you. today. Sure. And thanks for watching, guys. And thank you for leaving your questions and comments, as always. We will see you on the next stream. The series, right. you know, you, you go back and you talk to some people who were witnesses who had give, given some type of, um, of a statement, at least to the police. And then they just figured, well, like, well, they're the police. They're handling it. Right. right? Like, yeah. people still have faith in the system. Mm -hmm. Uh, or at least used to still have faith in the system. I had faith in the system. Still? No, I had. I had. I had 100% faith in our system. I, you know, when they picked me up, I was like, okay, well, they're just going to look at the facts, and I'm going to go home. It's that simple. And that's the way it should be. Not what happened in my case. It's not what happened in so many other cases. And I'm wondering, if there's a bad apple here or there, and then they, they hide evidence, or they don't look at the facts, and, you know, they end up sending an innocent person to prison, that's one thing. But when this happens in every state across our nation over and over and over again, you have to wonder what is going on here. And those are the questions that have to be answered. The reality is that until there's accountability, until these people are held accountable and put in prison for hiding evidence, manipulating evidence, you know, basically making up evidence, 
then nothing's going to change, or we're going to keep losing innocent lives. I don't understand how another person can do this to another person, but it happens every day. And if they're going to continue to do that because of the, the procedures that are in place, those procedures have to change. Well, one of the things that's so interesting to me, and um, you still speak about Charles Erickson, who is, is essentially the, the reason that mm -hmm. you were in prison. Maybe not. You can correct me on that. But, you know, he... He at, at first said that, that you guys were together, but that you guys didn't really remember what had happened that night. Uh, and then slowly it all pieced together, and then he had a very detailed description right. of what happened and, uh, and implicated you. He's still in prison now. He later recanted his testimony, but you want to help him still. Right. Uh it's it's very complex, right? And I think when yeah, people sorry, look at I, I've oversimplified it there in my, <laughs> yep. in my brief explanation. But. It's quite all right. Well, the, I've lived it, so I've I've had to understand it. And and otherwise, I probably wouldn't, um, you know. So the reality is, you have a kid who was picked up by the police. He's in this interrogation. He ends up being told that people see him at this crime scene. He thinks he was blacked out. I think he was asleep. But the reality is, they're saying you were there. The, these people saw you there, you had to have something to do with this. So he says, well, if I was, then Ryan you know, must have been with me. They, a quarter of all wrongful convictions that have been proven innocent by DNA evidence, people have confessed to those crimes and they had nothing to do with it. So it's not one or two people making these weird decisions. This is a systemic issue and we have to address that. And, and Erickson is one of those individuals. So I look at it and I say, Erickson is one of these 25%. This is a problem that's happening in our interrogations. We need to change that. So who's responsible? The detectives are responsible for that. The people who are our authorities, the people who are there to serve and protect us, they are responsible because they, are, they should be looking at the facts and determining what's real and what's not. And in this case, they did not do that. And that's what you see in most of these. It's one of those where you can see it time and time and time again. And until they start to be you know, held accountable for not caring about justice and truth, then you're gonna see it happen over and over again. So Erickson is a pawn, he is a victim. He's one of many victims that have been, you know, taken advantage of the same way. And unfortunately my life was thrown in there as well. Did you always feel that way about him or is that something that you I didn't come no. to terms with now? Right, and that's that, that's what you know, I didn't understand it at first. I didn't know when I was arrested you didn't hear about wrongful convictions that often. This is, you know, thirteen years ago. It's picked up a lot since then, which is great. We're talking about this. But I didn't know what was going on. I thought this kid was just making things up for no reason. I didn't understand that the police were, were lying to people and they were illegally allowed to do this. They were manipulating people, that they were fabricating evidence. So now that I can see how the system operates and that it's not just these people that happens all the time, it's, you know, I, I've met so many people. I get emails every day and they are heartbreaking. You know, families just reaching out for help because they, they don't have the funds and, you know, I mean, you can't, it's stacked against you. The state has limitless power, limitless resources, and, and we, the public, we don't have anything. And so you get these emails, and it's just every day. It's more more cases that you want to look into and hopefully expose to the world. Now, obviously, every case is unique, but is there anything that you feel, is there some type of pattern that does emerge when oh. you see some kind of, you know, wrongdoing on yeah. the part of the state and putting the wrong person in jail? Certainly. There, there are a lot of patterns. That's a great point. And, and the reality is you look at these cases and you see that there wasn't a thorough investigation. The police picked some people up and they put their blinders on. And once the blinders go on, that's it. I mean, that's, your life is pretty much over at that point. They don't look at who else could have committed the crime. They start hiding evidence that proves that person's innocence. And so you see these factors over and over and over again. So it all starts with the interrogation. And people need to realize, if you get picked up and you're in an interrogation, they're trying to get a conviction against you at that point. It's not about finding the truth. So you should really avoid speaking to the police. That's why they tell you, get an attorney, don't talk to the police. It's, it's the best advice you can get. But why is that the case, right? I mean, in, in, That's in, a great question. In, yeah, in part Ryan, A, thank you for joining us today. Pleasure to have you here. And if anybody is the perfect host uh, and, you know, somebody who really has personal experience of something like this, it is you yourself. You were in prison for 10 years for a crime that you didn't commit and then were exonerated. But first, just tell me, you know, why, why, are, you, why are you doing this now? Why are you doing a TV show? Why are you helping others instead of, you know, taking care of yourself? You lost 10 right. years of your life. Right. Well, it's an honor to be here. Thank you so much. A uh, great question. Um, you know, it doing this show is kind of taking care of myself. I think, you know, looking back, I lost 10 years of my life, 19 to 29. I missed all of my 20s. And right now, it doesn't, it, it doesn't make sense. I shouldn't have lost that for anything, right? I have nothing to do with this crime. 
But if I can stop this from happening to other people, if I can expose injustice and maybe get accountability for police and prosecutors, then those 10 years I lost will mean something because other people won't lose you know, years of their life. So. How many people did you meet while you were in prison who, who also said that, the, that they were innocent or that said that the same thing happened to them? Uh, I met I met probably you know twenty that said they were innocent and and ten of them I would say that I, I definitely believe are most likely innocent and um, and that's just in the prison that I was in mm -hmm. but otherwise.